Ladies and gentlemen, I'm Andrew Natsios, the director of the Scowcroft Institute at the Bush School of Government. And on behalf of my friend and associate, Dr. Jerry Parker, who's the head of the uh, pandemic program in the Scowcroft Institute, we would like to, to welcome you to this Scowcroft event. Uh, Dr. Joseph Fair is a modern day international disease detective who travels the world in search of plagues before they become global catastrophes. Dr. Fair has authored or co-authored more than 45 peer-reviewed articles on virology, public health, emergency response, and virus hunting in disease hotspots around the world. Dr. Fair, Dr. Fair's work as an international outbreak responder has been highlighted on 60 Minutes, the cover of the Washington Post, CNN, Al Jazeera, National Public Radio, Vice News, NBC News, and other media outlets. Uh, Dr. Fair has a unique ability to take the complexities of natural disasters, outbreaks, and pandemics, and the convergence of factors leading to the rise in the tide of infectious disease, and breaking them down into a simple, understandable concept for the general public. In addition to his media appearances, Dr. Fair has risen to prominence as an international leader in outbreak response and has appeared on congressional and Senate uh, committee uh, panels, hearings, with the most senior leadership in the United States and international governments or, or, or uh, governments in other countries, where his ability to break down concepts and explain outbreaks has been invaluable. He is a graduate of Loyola, Loyola University of New Orleans and Tulane University. He has a PhD in virology and a master's in public health. Uh, he has just now been named as a senior fellow of the Scowcroft Institute. I just signed the letter today. <laughs> and in AgriLife has been appointed as a research professor with the Center for Global Health and Innovation. So he's now one of us. Is that right? Joseph? Okay, thank you. So join me in welcoming our speaker this afternoon, this evening, Dr. Joseph Fair. Thank you. Thank you very much for that very esteemed introduction, and I've got to give it my first try. Howdy. Howdy. Now, I'm from a really country area, so that's hard for me to do without going back to my roots, but I'll do it. <laughs> So today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about uh, public health in the modern world. Uh, we're all familiar with a few of the bigger pandemics and epidemics that have occurred of late uh, Ebola. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about flu, which you really should be paying attention to this year and next year. Um, hopefully not as bad as we predict it to be. Some historical precedents and how these things happen and try to break it out a little bit. Um, I don't know if anyone in this room has ever worked in or is familiar with the intelligence world, but public health is a lot like the intelligence world. And that may seem counterintuitive, but I'll draw this analogy to it. Um, if we're doing our job in public health, the public is largely never going to know anything happened because it really didn't happen to that big of an extent. However, if we miss something, everyone's going to know. <laughs> so it works a lot like intelligence in that, in that uh, regard. And I can draw an example of that, um, H1N1. Does everyone remember that from 2009? Uh, we thought it was going to be the global killer flu. The reality is it very well could have been. There was only a few nucleotides difference in that flu virus from the 1918 flu. And so that 1918 flu, we knew that to be the global killer. So we send out the warnings across the world. Billions of dollars were spent in response and uh, preparation. And then afterwards, largely, it was a lot of cry wolf. People thought we were hyping the system up for no good reason. The reality is we did exactly what we were supposed to do in that situation, and it could have been a lot worse. And that will occur again. So at least in this audience, when you're hearing everyone else say they're probably just hyping it up, just say, well, I've heard different. Mm. OK, um, I always start with this quote. This quote. Uh, anyone know where this is coming from? Any? Yeah, absolutely. So Shakespeare was oddly prophetic in how epidemics and pandemics start. Um, I'll just show this picture here on the left. So a lot of people have a lot of different ideas about how do people get diseases from wild animals, especially gorillas, chimpanzees, that type of thing. Uh, a lot of the areas of the world that I work in in particular, 
there is no agriculture per se. There are no cattle fields. There's not a lot of sheep. Um, it's not easy to get meat, so meat is obtained through bush meat. Uh, this is a picture from Gabon, from National Geographic. Uh, there's about five endangered species there. Uh, you can see a non-human primate. These are Gaboon vipers. Um, this is in Sierra Leone. These are very common sites that you would see. Uh, civet cats, leopards. Uh, this is a picture in Guangzhou. So this is just an average market in Guangzhou. This is a virologist's worst nightmare picture. Uh, chickens, ducks, and humans all in the same area. I have another one with a baby kind of sitting in the middle. Um, and then you hear, have here that same market just downstream from it where everybody's handling the meat without gloves. There's a lot of blood. There's a lot of exchange. So it's actually really simple in a lot of places. You have a cut on your finger. It happens when you're cooking the meat. It doesn't happen from cooked meat just like anything else. If you cook it, it's going to kill it. It happens in the preparation. So people cut themselves while they're cooking this meat. Or say if they're out hunting the bush meat in the forest, it's an area where you just get a lot of cuts naturally. And so when you're handling those animals that you've just shot or killed in some fashion and they're bleeding also, that leads to blood mixing. So to give you an example, of maybe a big one that you would know of how that happened would be HIV. So probably what happened with HIV, and this is our best guess up until this point, is that you did have some individual that was out you know, hunting uh, a monkey and that the family ate that for a meal and it was in the preparation that the blood was exchanged. And there was probably one, maybe two cases that wandered into a hospital, say, in the 1920s in Brazzaville. That probably, uh, that coincided right around the time of missionary medicine in that area. And it was really before we knew uh, very much about germ theory and especially passing needle to needle to needle. Uh, and so that probably one or two individuals came in ill with a disease that someone locally probably thought was malaria because there was no way to, unless it's uh, said otherwise, it's malaria in most of these areas. And then they administered antibiotics and then they went on to the next patient with the same needle and administered antibiotics. And it's through that uh, explosion, that uh, explosive combination of a single spillover event, maybe one or two spillover events, combining that with Western medicine and the uh, uh, practices at the time that we have the HIV pandemic that we have today. <coughs> so man and our microbes, um, a lot of times we want to see microbes as our enemies. Um, I think more and more in modern society especially, we're coming to know microbes as absolutely essential to our life. Anybody that is a microbiologist can tell you that they are essential to every single part of life. They are the oldest form of life. Viruses represent the evolution of life just before it became life. Um, so really you can consider them our oldest friend and our oldest enemy. Uh, friend in the sense that it controls everything from your metabolism and how much weight you gain when you eat certain foods and enemies to when you get the flu and you're at home uh, with various manifestations. We exist in harmony really with the vast majority of microbes around us. Um, and we're constantly transferring these microbes between us as persons. And then also, if you have pets or if you have livestock, you're constantly getting their diseases too. Now, these diseases may not be making you sick, but be assured you are getting them and they are being transmitted to you. I don't mean you're going to die with them or anything like that. But there is the occasional disease that uh, a mutation will happen, either in a disease that we have known for some time and hasn't been deadly for humans, and a mutation happens that results in a pathogenic agent or one that causes disease. Uh, or mutations can happen over time due to our own actions. So antibiotic resistance is a perfect example of that. Um, not really talking about viruses, but that is a pandemic that we have uh, put on ourselves and we have yet to face, and we're still going to face the worst of that unless the trend changes, and right now it hasn't. Occasionally, and when increasing fle uh, frequency, these uh, single pathogens uh, uh, undergo what we call a spillover event. So literally, they spill over from the animal to the human. Typically, that is through that blood interaction that I talked about earlier, but it can also be respiratory in the case of flus and uh, SARS, coronaviruses. Uh, and those typically are the primary routes for that spillover event. <coughs> Spillovers usually only happen once or twice, and that's where the animal has given the disease directly to the human, and then it goes from human to human to human. And that's really the birth of an epidemic. Um, and this really is the cycle of life. This is not something that's happening now. It's not something that's happening particularly worse for our generation than others. The reality is we have a lot more pressures on our environment now. We have a lot more people. We have a lot less resources. And just the basic physics of it, we're going to be bumping into each other a lot more. And we are as a globe right now. 
so they're going to be happening with increasing frequency, and it's not something we can ever let our guard down. There's never going to be a silver bullet for it. It's always going to be evolving. Um, plays have been described throughout history, um, and they all have these very similar kind of depictions. And I can tell you from at least Ebola, West Africa, and that was not my first Ebola outbreak, but definitely my worst. These were the types of scenes that you were seeing. There were bodies littered throughout the streets. Um, everyone was afraid to touch them. Uh, if you could pay someone to go and bury them, then that person is usually not allowed to be back in their village. And plagues are interesting because we tend not to think about them unless they're happening. And so we've had many, many incidences over the centuries where we've had devastating plagues, both in Europe and the United States, the 1918 flu. But if it didn't happen to your generation, you typically don't see a plague as your primary threat or priority. Um, but just generationally, you can think in almost every major religious text, uh, one of the endings of the world is going to be plague. So we've known it for a long time that plagues are a problem, so much so that one of the four horsemen is considered such. So the original plague fighters, uh, some people think this is a gothic image, but it actually is the original PPE or personal protective equipment for plague doctors. Um, this mask, although it looks like a beak, uh, was made for a reason that was actually filled with med medicinal herbs. And so it was thought at the time that those herbs would block the plague bacterium. They didn't know it was a bacterium, but the miasma, as they called it at the time, they thought that it would block the miasma from coming in. Now, with what they did there, you know, did the herbs help? Probably not. But what they did actually did help. That is personal protective equipment. Uh, while it looks different now in modern day, we still do the same thing. They wore gloves. They used a, a metal prod to touch the patients, and they wore their mask always. So the plague doctors, actually, not many of them died. Um, this is an interesting picture for me because this is uh, a turning point in United States history. This is New York in the 1890s. This was really the first U.S. public health force. It was called the White, Court, the White Coat Force. Uh, there were incredible amounts of cholera and all, all kinds of other developing world diseases that you just get ba from lack of basic sanitary conditions. So it was at that time, and this was just after Typhoid Mary, uh, in fact, uh, and various typhoid outbreaks that the first public health service was established for New York, and they were co-deployed with the police force. And so. This was a force that was celebrated in the streets and that they had regular duties every day just like a cop would. We have those uh, same institutions more or less now, but uh, much less emphasis on them and much less regard for them, I would argue. Uh, and this is the face of the modern day plague fighters. I'm sorry about the resolution on these photos, but I, you probably saw the Time article celebrating the, the plague doctors, etc. This is your typical PPE or personal protective equipment that the modern plague doctor would wear. Um, I want to point this out because we made this and we make these to work in the United States and in Europe. Um, these are plastic suits, the Tyvek suits, if anybody's ever worn them, it's like wearing a garbage bag. Uh, N95 mask, kind of the same thing, the Tyvek goes over your head. Then you've got goggles on. Uh, so you can imagine your internal body temperature around this point is around 100 degrees. The weather outside is around 105 and there's no air or circulation in any of these. So something that we had not really particularly dealt with in other outbreaks because they weren't of this magnitude was just the physical ability to wear this stuff and treat patients safely. Uh, we had to have more people because we had people fainting, passing out. Uh, a lot of people became very ill on the job, and that's not something you want to do when you're around Ebola patients because you don't want to think you possibly have Ebola, so you try to keep yourself as healthy as possible. Thankfully, since Ebola 2014, there's been some significant redesigns from this uh, out of programs like Grand Challenges and things like that, uh, sponsored by the U.S. and others, and I think that's really helped a lot. Kent Brantley here, uh, this is the U.S. physician. He was the first physician, to, or first person, really, to receive the ZMAP treatment. I don't know if you heard about that uh, while we were there. Um, that's a bit of a controversial story just because it was held back from a local Sierra Leonean physician who was really kind of the national hero of Sierra Leone uh, and the tube was sitting right next to his bed while arguments were going on over the ethics of giving it to him or not. Uh, he then expired and that same tube was then flown uh, and administered to this individual that lived afterwards. Now, I'm not blaming Kent Branley for that and he only recently found out about this story and feels incredibly guilty about it, but it's not his fault. Um, and the point being, you know, how do we value life in these situations? And 
I can tell you from both arguments here, uh, coming from a DOD background and working in Africa on infectious disease, there are a million conspiracy theories about what we're doing there and why we're there and are we making weapons. And so injecting a local with an experimental drug that could possibly launch them into anaphylactic shock carried with it a high, very high risk so of people saying, You're, you just killed our doctor. So there was a lot of arguments back and forth between physicians about whether they could do that or not. Uh, my argument was that he was a physician and that he could make an informed decision. That being said, things happened the way they did. ZMAP did prove effective and is now considered the standard of care for Ebola. Uh, without this outbreak, that would have taken another 20 to 25 years of research and experimental trials. This was a very special circumstance to where the, um, the treatment was given in an experimental condition. And, we're not likely to see that ever again unless there is an outbreak of this magnitude just because that skips many, many years of regulations and protocols and studies that we do for safety and efficacy. Um, these are the heroes uh, locally, the burial teams. Uh, these guys just couldn't work hard enough. Uh, 18 hours a day wearing these suits, constantly out. All they're doing is getting bodies. Uh, with Ebola in particular, there's a protocol that you have to bury them 10 feet down. And so this is mostly by hand digging. Um, everything is in PPE and then of course once you come back from that you can't come home so your village uh, has ostracized you just because you're dealing with the death and the infection. Um, I'm just showing myself here in a P4 suit just because this is a popular misconception. I want you to notice the difference between this suit and the suit on movies. On movies they always have helmets. Helmets leak. Why we wear these is they're blown up like big uh, balloons and so if there is a hole in it the air goes out not in, so that's how you know a real one. We don't have little microphones inside or really cool lights, and they're not telling us our body temperature or anything like that. I wish it was that advanced, but we're not there yet. Uh, I've mentioned Ebola a couple of times now, and I'll, I'll talk about it a few times tonight. Um, I had, previous to March of 2014, I had responded to, I would say, uh, three outbreaks of Ebola, uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo and in Gabon. And I'll go into why those outbreaks were different, but those were very, very different from, uh, from what we saw in West Africa. And basically, we expected to see the same thing that we had seen in those countries happen in West Africa. But uh, due to a variety of factors, which I'll go into in just a second, uh, it turned out extremely different. So the first case, uh, or really when I was called up, so this was on 23rd March, the World Health Organization published that there was a, a notification of outbreak. And that's typically how this worked. I got my first communication from them on the 24th because this had happened so close to the Sierra Leone border and I had a laboratory present in Sierra Leone on that border. So they asked me to start looking out for Ebola on the Sierra Leone side. And so we started at that point doing very heavy um, surveillance in Sierra Leone, um, spreading on to Liberia from there. But the virus sped very quickly between Guinea, Liberia, Sierra Leone, Nigeria, Senegal, the U.S. and Europe, those were exported cases, but we did have our cases, first cases here in the U.S., and everyone knows how that worked. Um, there was Texas, there was New York. Uh, I can tell you a lot of people paid for those mistakes, and I don't mean just the people, the decision makers in Texas, the responders who came back after that really paid for those mistakes. I was one of them. Um, where it ended up being more like a criminal investigation and treatment after you got back in, and uh, nobody understood what you were doing there in the first place. Uh, to give you the historical context of where Ebola outbreaks have happened and kind of their size and scale, they've largely stuck around the Central African region. Uh, in 1976, uh, there were two outbreaks just across the border in Sudan and in the Congo. The virus had never been seen before that time. This was its first time in recorded history. And the two outbreaks, even though they happened almost simultaneously, were actually different forms of Ebola. So what does that tell me? Um, I try to put on my ecology hat when I'm thinking about things like that. And so there must have been something in the species that is spreading the disease at that point, a stress in their life. And when you go back and look at these areas during that time, 1976, this was a very, very heavy mining area, it still is. Um, so a lot of disruption of local bat populations, which leads to stress and immune compromisation. And so once they're immunocompromised, we believe that they then shed the virus. They become nervous, uh, anxious, et cetera, and their, their own immune system's lower enough to where they start shedding the virus, and that's why humans get it. At least that's the latest theory. Um, we've also found some interaction with wild pigs in this area. The largest up, outbreak up until 14 was really roughly 350 people, and we would, we would have considered that major. That would have been a major outbreak for us. 
Uh, once we got past the 5,000 number here, we knew we were in completely different territory. Um, what, how did we get that high of a number? Um, and I'll go over the specific numbers in a minute. I can't tell you how we got that high without explaining a little bit of the geography, because that's really what played into this. Um, Guinea, Sierra Leone, Liberia, and Ivory Coast are actually part of a union. It's called the Mano River Union. That's an economic block of states, so there's a heavy exchange of um, trade and uh, culture between the nations. And the main reason for that really is these borders are only colonial borders. The tribes in these regions cross each of these borders. You don't necessarily have that in most of the rest of Africa. Um, you definitely have tribalism in other countries, but this area in particular, it's like one big country, uh, and borders are extremely porous. You go to family reunions in Guinea, you come back that evening to Sierra Leone. You go to sell your fruit in Liberia, you come back that evening to Sierra Leone. So constant travel and trade throughout. Um, Sierra Leone and Liberia went through roughly 10 years of civil war, so the travel and trade was pretty much stopped during most of that time. But ironically, one of the reasons that this Ebola became so bad was that the UN had invested more than 10 years of building roads and infrastructure in all of that area. So it became hyper-connected within a 10-year period. So unlike Ivory Co or, sorry, unlike Gabon or DRC, where we've had this happen before, where we're out in the middle of nowhere and it's really hard to even get to the outbreak, this was the completely opposite scenario. Everybody had a car. Everybody had a motorcycle. Uh, a patient walks into a treatment facility, and this is where you come into kind of the nuances of what we do and how you structure your messaging. The public health messaging at, at the time was there is no treatment or cure for Ebola you should show up to a treatment center. Um, now, in this country, we tend to associate, if we're going to be in a hospital, we're gonna have a better chance of surviving because of supportive care and those types of things. That was not the message that came across there. That came across as, there's absolutely nothing we can do for you, so we'd like to just get you out of the community and let you die in this place. Um, and it ended up to, in a lot of really dehumanizing situations, and that was all due, due to fear. Uh, I can't tell you how many times that we would have uh, ambulances come, literally just kick people out of the door, and at some points even kids. The kids didn't even know where they were going back to. We had no idea what their name was, if they were positive, if they were negative, if their parents were around, et cetera. So we have a lot of numbers for this outbreak, but the reality is our numbers are incredibly inaccurate because we have no idea where a lot of those people came from or if they made it. Um, this area is really famous for its blood diamonds and conflict, and that really had a lot to do with the response. And you might ask why that would have a lot to do to the response. So you have these major public health catastrophes. So who do you look for for your help? Your government. Mm -hmm. But when you don't trust your government and you think your government is the most corrupt government in the world because they've been dealing in blood diamonds and conflict, et cetera, when the government tells you to do something, you do the exact opposite of what the government told you to do. And that's exactly what happened to us really over a year long period. And the country that made the, uh, the turn on that first was Liberia. Liberia realized before any of the other countries that it was up to Liberians to stop this outbreak. They stopped relying on the international aid to come in once the airlines stopped flying in. The US military did come, but it took uh, nearly three months to stand up everything. And in terms of an outbreak, that's an enormous amount of time. So Liberians themselves learned basic social distancing practices and how to protect themselves from the virus. They got much more adept at reporting it when they saw it, so it became much more rapidly responded when there was a case isolated. And so they really turned the corner themselves. Um, the other countries did it more so with international intervention and help and uh, their systems have largely gone back to the same since then. Um, the way outbreaks work, you'll have a lot of attention on an area for a while. You have a lot of infrastructure placed in that area for a while, but when it's off of everyone's mind, we move on to somewhere else. Um, so why is it different? I, I mentioned some of this only, it was really only colonial borders. Uh, the tri-state region where the outbreak first occurred is a major nexus of commerce and trade. So this area right here, there's a river. So the Mano River runs, oh, sorry about that. The Mano River runs right through there. And so this is a major nexus of trade for these three countries. And basically one big tribe that is known for uh, its business skills and trading. The public health infrastructure over the last 10 years in those countries was already null, um, broken down completely. We were building it back from scratch. Sierra Leone, it's interesting, uh, that country itself, if you had looked maybe two months, I believe, before the <coughs> Ebola outbreak, 
there was an article in the New York Times praising Sierra Leone for its healthcare system because they had offered free healthcare for every child, 10 and under. The system was making vast improvements, et cetera. And then you had a pandemic that, or an epidemic rather, that completely uh, brought it back to, I would call minus one at this point. Uh, they lost many of their healthcare workers, and in a country where you didn't have many to start, it's not easy to start over. Denial. Uh, there was a lot of denial when this first happened. Um, I was speaking with someone earlier today, I, someone in the audience here about Liberia. Uh, when this first happened in Liberia, it was popular, popularly believed that this was a conspiracy by the Liberian government to get money because it was the end of Ellen Johnson's term and uh, the coffers of the country were not uh, robust. So many of the citizens saw this as a, a way just to get international aid and they didn't think it was real. So they paid no attention to any of the warnings that we were given uh, and just kept going on about their business until they realized that friends and family were dying. So this is what the cost of failure looks like. Um, out of total, we had 11,310 deaths from this one epidemic uh, in slightly over a year. We had a total of 28,616 confirmed cases. Um, and look at the difference between confirmed and the, the total. So there's roughly 15,000 people that we don't know if they had it or not. We just know that they were really, really ill and that they died. Uh, could have been malaria, could have been Ebola. Uh, they had the symptoms, often the symptoms are the same. So without laboratory testing, we couldn't tell. The other really confounding factor in this area, uh, unlike other parts of Africa, they already had a hemorrhagic fever. Um, this is a hemorrhagic fever that happens every day in that area, Liberia, Sierra Leone, Guinea, Lassa fever. Uh, I'm sure many of you remember the book, The Andromeda Strain, that was actually written about Lassa fever um, because it showed up in the 60s and nobody knew what this was, so they thought it was some alien virus that was killing people very quickly. But this is the, the basic public health measures you can take for Lhasa, and I always find this really interesting. This is in the local language, but uh, one of the most successful public health, have public health programs ever by the Centers for Disease Control was the simple introduction of house cats into villages in West Africa. Cats are just not kept as pets normally in that area, but you introduce a lot of cats into a village, you have a lot less rats. And um, once we taught people kind of how to maintain their population of cats, et cetera, now that actually works really well, quite well. Uh, covering your food and water, clean your house really well. They're saying if you do find the rat, try to put a glove on or something like that. Wash your hand with black soap. Black soap is a, a local term for soap with chlorine in it. Um, I put this picture up here just because I can show you how prevalent this disease is. Now, keep in mind, in the Department of Defense's eyes, this is a priority one threat. This is a local taxi, uh, and this was just after the Civil War, and I was getting a ride in his car, and I looked at the back of the car, and that says, I'll give you lots of fever. And uh, I was like, that's a very interesting tagline you have on your taxi. And he was like, that's how I keep the robbers away. He's like, nobody sticks me up. He's like, this is the lots of fever car. Um, this is the rat. So they call it the multi-mammate rat. You can see why. Uh, it has pups of about tw 24 to 26, about three times a year. Um, What's interesting about this disease, completely opposite from Ebola, this is like flu, it's seasonal. You're gonna have it every year, you're gonna have it in the same places. And now with land use change, uh, cutting down a forest for agriculture, the, uh, really the only animal that thrives in that environment is this rat. So we're seeing this, this disease spread much further now. So why was this a problem? So Lhasa is treatable. There's actually a treatment for it. Um, it was accidentally found in the 70s. It was, it's ribavirin. It's a treatment used for other common viruses, but it actually happens to work for loss of fever. So why was this a problem during Ebola? Well, we got over, so overwhelmed with Ebola, we could no longer distinguish between, we didn't have the capacity or the time or the ability to test if it's loss or if it's Ebola, but if I'm putting someone with loss into an Ebola tent, I'm pretty much securing their death, whereas I could have treated them with loss. Um, a lot of other scenarios happen like that of suspected cases. Suspected cases sent to a treatment center, put in a room with positive cases, and it is in that suspected case room where they became positive. They weren't positive before they went in. So failures in the response system just simply due to we had never had these kinds of numbers before and we didn't know how to cope. Um, this is something I, you know, I, I say this for loss of fever, but this is true in general. These diseases always affect the poor the most. Um, it's uh, due to sanitary conditions, it's due to access to health care, it's due to education level, it's due to many, many myriad factors, but uh, it always disproportionately affects the poor.
So was Ebola new to West Africa? Um, I've kind of focused on this a lot just because this was a paper of mine that I had published, or tried to publish, I should say, and that's the key word here, before this Ebola outbreak where I was looking at patients that were admitted for that disease, loss of fever. But about 50% of them were testing negative for loss of fever, so I knew they had to have something, so I went through these other diseases to see what they had. And I looked at their antibodies, particularly their IgM antibodies, and if you're not an immunologist, IgM just means you were recently exposed to something, and it tends to be uh, fairly specific, specific enough that it can recognize different uh, families of viruses and even different species within those viruses. So we looked at these different viruses and pretty much everything we looked for we found except for Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever. But the really interesting one, Ebola, uh, and particularly Ebola Zaire. So we found 19 patients. Uh, now keep in mind the, the objective of my study here. These are patients that were admitted to a hemorrhagic fever ward because a physician somewhere saw them and said these people have hemorrhagic fever they need to go to the Lhasa ward because, of course, they think it's Lhasa being in that area. So they have all the symptoms. They have hemorrhagic fever. They have all of it. Uh, negative for Lhasa, negative for malaria, but they have IgM antibodies to Ebola Zaire. Now, I reported this. Uh, I was working for DOD at the time. I reported this to the World Health Organization. I reported this to the local governments. I reported it through all of our various channels of reporting that we have to do in government. That being said, this didn't set off any alarm bells. This was really considered a passive kind of study just because it wasn't an acute outbreak. But I was telling people, you know, it is present here in Sierra Leone. We have every uh, indication that it is present. So this paper wasn't published for the longest time. It was held in review, and uh, it was done so by peer review because they didn't think the geography was right for Ebola. And they said that those results couldn't be real. So the very first week of the declared outbreak in Sierra Leone, this paper was published <laughs> with high priority, <laughs> which was really nice for me. <clears throat> I'll give you another very familiar, and you know, I, I mentioned, you should really pay attention to flu this year. Uh, I'll go back to H1N1. Now, we thought that that wasn't going to be so, or we thought that that was going to be much worse than what it actually was. This year, we're kind of having the opposite trend, but it's even more frightening in that what we are seeing is much worse than what we're expecting, and it's only in small numbers now. So what happens when that starts to, uh, when the infectivity rate, or the r not as we call it, increases, and we start getting uh, versus one person to three people, one person to 10 people, uh, and including with that even super spreaders. Super spreaders are individuals for either immunological reasons or social reasons they tend to shed or spread more virus than anyone else uh, one of the more famous cases was in SARS I want to say there was one individual responsible for 95 secondary infections whereas most other people were like two or three people so this was a, a very popular individual um, this is you know the 1918 flu and I think we've all seen these pictures but this is what we will see with flu if that happens again uh, we are very little, <laughs> we are a little more prepared than we were at this time. Yes, we do have vaccines, uh, we do have vaccine facilities, we do have drugs, Tamiflu, for example. So would we see um, the mortality that we saw during this? Yes, and it's because of numbers. We don't have enough of any of those things and they're not anywhere developed to the stage that we could deploy them on a mass basis to a global community that would need it. And that's one of the things you're working on here at Texas A&M, which is exciting. Um, you can look here at uh, the mortality in America and with this flu. And this is what's worrisome with about flu in general. Most people don't know about this, about 1918. It actually appeared in two phases. The first phase really wasn't that bad. It was just like we're seeing now. It was a few individuals that got really sick and died. And then it kind of went through a lull. That fall, it came back raging and killed 18 million people. And so that's why we're never going to be complacent with flu. Another reason we're never going to be complacent with flu, it is spread through chickens and pigs and ducks, everything that we rely on for our livestock, and then wild birds carrying it in between those populations. Um, the more closely related we are to a species, the easier it is for us to get their diseases. So we are around a lot of pigs and we are very closely related to pigs, so flu comes very naturally for, for, for us from pigs. Um, I don't know how many scientists we have in the room, but to explain why avian flu is called avian flu is it bypasses the pig phase. It goes directly from the bird to the human, and that's what scares us so much about it because it's through the pig and the mixing in the pig that actually makes the virus less pathogenic for us humans. 
Uh, if it doesn't go through that phase, like with avian flu, you have roughly a 98% case fatality rate. Thus far, we've never seen a case of avian flu transmitted human to human, but that is really one of our greatest fears, that, that avian flu would become human to human transmitted. Um, 1918 actually had a really personal connection with my own family. There are 10 members of my family in our family crypt that died of 1918 flu, um, here in Texas, actually. Uh, I've never actually been to this crypt. This is a family member here in Texas that sent me this. Uh, but our, my local connection to the 1918 flu. Uh, I always love this statement by Patton. Um, you know, I looked at West Africa, and many of us came back there with feelings of survivor's guilt, failure. You don't go into public health to lose, and you don't go into outbreaks to have them turn out like this one did. And so the best thing that we can do is learn from the mistakes there. Um, this was a book that uh, Jerry's going to appreciate this. Dave Friend, gave me, Dave Friend gave me this book almost 20 years ago, which is funny because it was 20 years to solve the problem. We're at the end of the 20 years now, so let's hope that that wasn't exactly uh, correct. But it basically put out five major threats that were going to end civilization, and uh, pandemics were one of them. And so the, con the, uh, the resolve in this book was that ultimately none of us can do this alone. There's a lot of government effort on all of this. CDC, Department of Defense, Health and Human Services, Department of Homeland Security, USDA, all of them have programs aimed at some components of these. Um, some of them are making vaccines, some of them are making drugs, some of them are making better tests so that we can see them. Uh, some of the parts of government that focus on just training people, uh, like the CDC EIS program, where they're training people to be epidemiologists all around the world and installing that in academic institutions like Texas A&M, so that it will last much longer than our international aid to that country will, and it'll be something that is permanently established. Um, we did see this happen with this last outbreak, and I think that was largely due to the White House's Grand Challenge initiatives. Um, they brought people together that normally never sit in the room together and gave us a mission and money. And uh, I have to say, after I've been through that model, I think that is the way that we should approach all future <laughs> great catastrophes or threats that we face in this country because really it has completely different perspectives, it's completely different resources, and it's completely different motivations. But if you can meet in the middle, uh, it tends to work out pretty well. Um, I presented this last time I was here at the Scowcroft, and uh, I, I'll, I will do so again. I've been thinking a lot about how we've responded to outbreaks in the past. And um, traditionally, what we have done, and it's been by necessity, is that either the countries themselves around the world build national laboratories or reference laboratories. Uh, those are very expensive endeavors. Um, most countries in the developing world, which is most of the world, can't afford to build those kinds of facilities. They can't afford to maintain those kind of facilities. Uh, nor do they have the means to train their personnel to work in those facilities safely. I would say probably over the last 15 to 20 years, our focus as a government in the United States uh, has been to aid these countries by building those laboratories for them, helping them train their personnel, and supplying them with the reagents. And there are many parts of those programs that have actually worked and worked really well. But there's also been a lot of it that didn't work so well. Uh, we went into it with a very American mentality. We built uh, giant buildings in, say, the Republic of Georgia um, that we just thought would be the best national lab you could ever have. But when they got the first month's power bill and realized that that was maybe one-tenth of their annual budget, that's just not going to work for them, right? So we've had a problem of building to scale and adapting locally. And so after this last response and uh, Something I'll explain that happens during these is that we don't have just one big government container or ship full of stuff that are made for outbreaks. I always, anybody that's, I, I always say this about conspiracy theories, anybody that believes in conspiracy theories has never worked in government <laughs> because it's really a struggle to get like conference calls together and things like that. That would require way too many people to be on the same page. Um, but. Uh, the, uh, the, the problem that we faced uh, in most of these outbreaks is that we get our logistics and supplies just like everybody else does. We get them shipped by FedEx, we get them shipped by cargo on Air France or Delta or something like that. Uh, what we saw in West Africa is that when you have a complete breakdown in society and everyone is scared to death of a pathogen that is being transmitted, all of those different corporations stop. They just stop going. Uh, it's not worth the risk to their personnel, it's not worth the risk to their country. 
Uh, I do have to give kudos to Brussels Airlines because Brussels Airlines refused to stop flying because of this outbreak. And I will never forget being on that flight. And actually, the president of Brussels Airlines was, was on it. And uh, he came on the flight and said, I just want you to know that I feel safe flying. And so everybody else will, too. So some of them really stepped up, but a lot of them, just out of pure necessity, stepped back. So that led me to think, what's a different way that we could do this? How could we make this much more coordinated? And you're going to see World Wildlife Federation up here, just very vaguely in the corner there. This is a, a new partnership, and it's something that I would like to kind of build off of for outbreak response. This is a new partnership between the Dutch government and the World Wildlife Federation, jointly funded. Uh, and they built a new research expedition vessel uh, that carries all of their equipment, everything from research to supplies to laboratories to personnel to transport. Um, I started asking myself, why couldn't we do the same thing for outbreaks? Because basically everything we use in outbreaks has come down to that same level of size or technology. Um, just to go through these very briefly, problem that we have in every single outbreak, and it's usually because, again, they occur in some of the worst spots in the world, lack of communications. Uh, there are no, um, sorry, I don't know if that pointer is working. I don't think it is. Uh, top right corner, you'll see a communications tower. Communications always are just terrible, just even placing phone calls. Ideally, the way that we do it in this country is that we put everything into software and we transmit the data electronically, but if you don't have a cell phone tower, we're struggling to basically just call people. We're yelling the results through the phone. They can't really hear you. You're going case by case by case. Completely inefficient way to do it. Um, after this last uh, Ebola outbreak, I will say that we went through much of West Africa and started building emergency operations centers. Uh, you're very familiar with that concept here at Texas A&M, and have excelled in uh, both building them and training them. That being said, um, emergency operations centers um, are a facility, and if you have people working in them that have not been trained in emergency operations procedures, it's just a facility. <laughs> so. We ended up building a lot of facilities and just kind of throwing people in there and saying, you know, this is your EOC and now you can handle this. Um, I promote the idea that I think it would be much more functional if we had a permanently functioning EOC structure on a ship where you can integrate people from the national government and they are there with you, reading the data with you, uh, and it's all working smoothly. A lot of what we do now focuses on genomics and genetics. Uh, so why, why was this Ebola strain different? That was a big question. We wanted to get that back for sequencing. And I emphasize get that back for sequencing because we didn't have a sequencer right there. Now we do. Um, but the thing with sequencers, the machines for sequencers are very small now. They're basically the size of a cell phone. But it is the computing that still takes the problem, uh, or takes the power. So you have to have entire servers just to kind of sort through this genetic data and analyze what makes it different. Those almost never exist locally. So again, another thing we could take with us, supplies, uh, mobile or emergency operations centers. This was a project that I wasn't involved with, but a company I was working with was, um, I think you probably saw that we were evacuating patients through Phoenix Air uh, for some time. That was a Gulf Stream. The same Gulf Stream, by the way, that was used for all of our extraordinary renditions. <laughs> So not very comfortable. Um, but that was the only airline that was willing to fly people that potentially had Ebola. Uh, they were willing to take the risk. And so basically, they sealed off the pilots after the plane. The second half of the plane was all um, contained. And we had very strict protocols about how we were to fly in that. So we knew there had to be a better way to do that. Uh, this was a public-private partnership between the Paul Allen Foundation and the Department of State. And this is our new answer to how we will transport, uh, transport American expatriates back from an outbreak, or um, especially of hemorrhagic fever, but of avian flu, et cetera, loaded into a C-130. Uh, everything is pressurized and self-contained. It can stay that way for a week. Caregivers can stay inside with the uh, patients, and it has all uh, the medical monitoring devices. Now, there's only one of these right now. and. Uh, in my thinking, this is something that we should take an example and build several of these. Uh, we don't have any of these at quarantine airports. Um, we don't have any of these on aircraft carriers. And you might ask, like, why would that be relevant? Well, say you have uh, special operations in Southeast Asia, and one of those uh, soldiers gets avian flu. You're going to want to isolate that soldier very quickly. Uh, and it's probably not going to be at a local hospital. In fact, it's definitely not going to be at a local hospital. You're going to be transported to US care. Uh, but how do you do that safely? So the safest thing is to have one of these on each carrier group, and that way you've always got a way to get your 
patients safely without exposing the rest of the ship and uh, to get them out and safely transported back to appropriate care. Um, these are a lot of, uh, I'm sorry, I keep using the pointer and it's not working, but uh, a lot of the vehicles on the right, et cetera, these are amphiba trucks. A lot of people don't realize these things exist, but they're pretty cool. Uh, they're four by four trucks uh, that then turn into high speed boats. Um, they're not cheap, but in these areas, there are very few roads. The roads that do exist are very bad, and then often you just come to a river, and your option is to stop. That's your option. <laughs> and so technologies like that, while they may seem uh, kind of uh, nice to haves, they're actually quite essential for what we're trying to do. Um, and then you would think, well, there's going to be a lot of outbreaks like in the middle of Congo. How would a ship like this help? Uh, that's why I put the air transport in there. That's mostly how we get samples to and fro, people to and fro anyway. So just having it on the ship makes it uh, nice and easy and convenient. And for our security people, uh, a major issue for national security and international security with regards to pathogens has always been what happens to the samples once you take them? So where do you put them? Do you put them in an old freezer that anyone has access to and someone can just come in and take it? These are, this would be a mobile floating secure repository. Um, the approach we've taken up until now is going into countries and building several million dollar uh, facilities in their country. Again, it's very hard for them to sustain. And admittedly, most of them don't even want it. They don't want that responsibility. They'd rather just get rid of the samples or destroy them. Um, so I present that this might be a better option in the future. And it just so happens that Texas A&M has a fleet of ships. <laughs> so this would be kind of the proposed partnership, uh, or somewhere to start, I would say. You have all the resources in Texas to be a pioneer in this field. And uh, given your own experience with Ebola, you know, pioneering stuff you may not even know about. UTMB has the Galveston National Lab, one of the largest uh, biocontainment labs in the, in the US. Texas A&M obviously has the Maritime Academy and the fleet in Galveston. Uh, and very few people know, and we, are, we have a, a very special privilege in this country to have a public health commissioned corps. Um, most people have no idea who they are. They think they're naval officers because the uniform and the rank is the same. Almost everything looks the same, uh, except that you'll notice that little caduceus on their, on their badge if you look really closely. Uh, they're actually not a Department of Defense uh, agency. They are uh, out of the Health and Human Services. Um, I think back to this, and I think I mentioned this in my last talk. Um, the United States Public Health Service, the reason you probably don't know it today, is it's really been diminished to a point that it's almost uh, not even acknowledged. Even when I was growing up, I can tell you that I knew Sue Everett Koop so well because he was on everything and his message about public health, even in primary schools. And that's really saying something coming from someone from a very strict Mormon background that they wanted to incorporate vaccinations and public health into primary school and education. So um, we still have a Surgeon General. You probably don't know who it is. Most people don't. <laughs> the branding is not there as it used to be. The reason I bring this up is uh, we were just mentioning in class earlier today that um, while it's new for our generation, the paradigm of the military and civilian sectors working together in epidemics has been there throughout history. Uh, just hasn't happened in modern history until Ebola. And uh, a lot of that is that risk aversion uh, image, you know, we're not there making biological weapons, we're not there to hurt your people, we're not there to take your sick people away and make weapons from them, we're there to help. So. Um, there's been a big divergence from that really over the last 30 years and military has stepped or stayed in its own realm more or less uh, very, I won't say little support in outbreak response, but I would say very little visible support in outbreak response. Um, a lot of support for it, but just not visible. Um, my idea here is that the perfect bridging agency for that civilian and military sector, because I observe this personally in Liberia, is when you have a lot of civilians that have never been in the military, never been exposed to the military, don't know how it works, there's a big learning gap there and people really, uh, it took a few weeks for people to kind of get into the groove and know how one another work and how the organizations work. Public health service is mostly civilians, but in a uniform and they understand rank and they understand chain of command and they understand how it all works. And then it even comes down to logistics. Um, once all the commercial flights had stopped, we had no way of getting people into Liberia, Sierra Leone, for example. 
we did have military flights, but uh, the way that works is if you're not uniformed, or if you're not in the system, you can't fly on that flight, but a public health officer can. So uh, while I would say that we are definitely on a trend of diminishing and almost disposing of our public health service, I would argue that we need to do exactly the opposite at this time. Uh, in fact, focusing a lot more attention on it. And I'm not a fan of building bigger government, but this is one that I would build a bigger, bigger part of. So, you know, the question here, war without an army, there we, what we found in Africa is we just don't have enough people to do this. And there were the people with the enthusiasm. Uh, and again, that's a, why I bring up the public health service as a potential awesome. And we had thousands of people volunteering from all over the world, especially the United States, to come and help. Uh, everything from nurses to doctors to vets. But the reality is, we had no idea what these people background were. We had no idea what kind of physical condition they were in. We had no idea what uh, knowledge they had with related to infectious disease. And to be frank, unless it was this worst case scenario, we would have never, ever, ever done that. Uh, I think a way that we could possibly avert that in the future would be establishing, uh, it, it already exists, uh, but just not in this capacity, a reserve corps for the public health service. I think there are so many nurses, doctors, physicians, vets. Uh, vets aren't really part of the public health service yet, uh, but I think that would be part of the new and future vision of One Health in the public health service. But I think that, that reserve status and allowing people, just those same people that, that wanted to volunteer and come and help us, allowing them to come in an organized fashion, knowing what training they have ahead of time and knowing where to place them based on that training, how to get them there safely, how to get them back safely if something happens, it's just a much more, honestly, in my opinion, logical approach to doing this. It will be expensive. It will be a cost. But like I said, um, these epidemics, these pandemics, these viruses that keep spilling over, this is not one and we're done and we don't have to worry about it anymore. This is constant vigilance. Um, since the origin of our species, it's had to be constant vigilance on the pandemics. And, uh, we're not going to be able to relax now, especially with the amount of people and the population that we have, population growth that we have. So who all kind of comes to these things? Um, we have nurses, EMTs, physicians, veterinarians. That's more increasing lately with the push towards uh, One Health and reservoir studies because what we have largely found is that oftentimes if you're paying attention to the animals, if there's a problem in the animals, there's probably gonna be a problem in the humans pretty close by. So getting those vets or people working with animals, and I say vets, primarily the people that we're asking to do this are your hunters, are your livestock breeders, going out to them, messaging. Tell me if you see something weird. Tell me if you see something strange in your animals, et cetera. And then the appropriate step after that would be to do the same thing with the physicians in the same area to see if there is any kind of spillover events. Epidemiologists, virologists, bacteriologists, diagnosticians, I put them in kind of a different category because you don't have to be a virologist or a bacteriologist to do that, but diagnostics is, is a mainstay of an outbreak. Um, anthropologists, uh, that ironically has only just now been incorporated into what we're doing. Um, and I, I'll give another irony, you know, countries like the DRC that have experienced uh, 30 years of Ebola outbreaks, they send anthropologists on every outbreak because they realize it is in the anthropology and the culture that you will stop the outbreak. That's how Liberia stopped their outbreak, was communicating to their own people in their own language and language they could understand. <clears throat> and having an awareness of their background and fears and that, you know, 10 years of civil conflict. Hazard communication specialists, just like I said earlier, people with the right message, someone that's not going to say there's no treatment or vaccine, but please do come and see us. Um, we need to word that a little bit differently before it goes out. Mathematician and modelers, you wouldn't think that, but that's how we project the spread. Whenever you see those graphs of we think it will go here, we think it will go here, that's all based on mathematical algorithms. And that's a growing field. Uh, I just returned from Washington yesterday where we had a, just a room full of mathematicians and modelers looking at infectious disease. Uh, logisticians just can't be underestimated how critical the logistics are. Um, you know, you try to think of these things like, I'm a laboratory person, so I'm going to go in and work on the laboratory. In reality, I have like 18 other jobs because I've got to get all the stuff to go into the laboratory. I've got to get the technicians rounded up to come in with me. I've got to do personnel. I've got to do HR. I've got to do all of these other things. Logisticians kind of take that away for you and let you do your job and let you do your job well. And so 
Uh, they're not always the most glorified of individuals, but they are the absolute critical link. <laughs> Uh, trauma psychologist, another area where the DRC has really led. I have to say, I had responded to two outbreaks there before, was on my third, and was on a flight back to the outbreak with a group of maybe 30 Congolese, and I had no idea what they were doing, and I asked them, and they said, oh, we're all trauma psychologists. We're there to talk to the community about what's happened and how to reintegrate people back into the village. So while we know that HIV is different from Ebola, that's not very well communicated here, right? They got the HIV message. If this person has it, they're going to have it forever. There might be treatment, but you have to be really careful. Ironically, people think that same thing is true for Ebola. So now we had to go back and do the retrospective campaign of Ebola is not HIV. Once this person is cured, they're cured. They can come back. Uh, I can't tell you how many people have been displaced from their homes just out of pure fear and psychology that they did have the disease and fear that they might bring it back with them even now. Architects, you might not think that's a logical choice. Uh, the building of these outbreak response, especially patient treatment facilities, is an art form, uh, especially in infection control, and it's a very complicated process. There are very few people specialized in doing it, but it's going to be needed more and more and more. Um, particularly for this audience, I need politicians and policy. Um, we can scream all we want, just like me with my little Ebola findings from Sierra Leone, screaming how important it is to me as a virologist. Uh, but that didn't reach the right person, right? And uh, even if it did reach that person, how do they interpret that as a threat? Because it was somewhat passive at that point. Retrospectively, if I was looking at that in a leadership position, if I saw that data, I would say we need to allocate and preposition some resources there just in case we do have an Ebola outbreak. Um, that would have been the right choice. And lastly, you, I don't know what you do, but it's all of our jobs in this room. Uh, you know, you can see this. I, I know Dr. Hotez has spoken here a lot about the anti-vax movement. We face the same problems with these epidemics, um, same exact problems. It's a conspiracy theory. You're here to inject us with something that's going to kill us. No, what you have already is going to kill you. We're here to try to help you uh, to not go through that. And uh, oddly enough, you see that a lot in this country. Uh, I moved back to New Orleans three years ago from Orange County where I was just incredibly amazed at the level of wealth and the lack of vaccination. Uh, it was incredible. Um, and I have spent most of my career in areas where parents are really willing to risk their lives to get their children to get those same vaccinations that we're turning down. Uh, so talk about a step back. And what was even more ironic from that is when I came back from Ebola, I had, uh, just like at social parties and things, people would ask me, oh, is there an Ebola vaccine? Because my kid, and I was like, do they have an MMR? You know, <laughs> so I'd worry about measles, mumps, and rubella first before Ebola. But uh, yeah, the mindset of fear. So I think I'll stop with that, um, and I'll take any questions you have, and I'm happy to dialogue about any of these, these points we've talked about and help you understand anything you want. Thank you. Well, jo Joseph, thanks. That was a riveting talk. Um, and um, my, my first comment is Texas A&M is going to be in the fight. We're going to join in the fight. Um, I think you know, we actually have expertise and willingness and ability to uh, fill many of the, the slots that yeah. you put on that last slide. And, um, part of that certainly is going to be a policy voice, and so we can Absolutely. beat the drum to, to keep up the fight. Um, wh one question, I'll take the moderator's prerogative to ask the first question, and then I want to open it up to the audience. Um, you mentioned uh, several times you're working for DOD, and yeah. you know, I think there's probably um, a good appreciation that you know, over, over the years, going back to literally Walter Reed, that military Absolutely. medicine has played a played a huge role in infectious diseases from the uh, turn of, from the 1900s to um, through World War II and so forth. But I don't think there's a good appreciation of some of the uh, current day efforts by the Department of yeah. Defense, particularly in some of the work that you've been doing in areas of the world um, where these things may emerge. And particularly some of the uh, public health, animal health capacity building. Can you speak a little bit about that and sure. why that's important to the Department yeah. of Defense? Absolutely. Now, I'll start it off by saying, you know, I am a regular critic of our own Department of Defense for not highlighting this type of work more. 
Everybody knows about how many bombs we drop. Everybody knows about how many people we've killed. Nobody seems to know about how many lives we've saved mm -hmm. or how many capacities we've built or how many laboratories we've built, et cetera. Um, I would say pre-9-11, but especially mm -hmm. post-9-11, we had a major emphasis on helping countries that where we knew a lot of these very dangerous uh, th diseases that also happen to be what we consider security risk were endemic. Uh, the Department of Defense really took on a mandate under what's called the Cooperative Threat Reduction Program uh, to engage foreign governments in a mil-civ cooperation, so military to civilian cooperation. Not the most common, uh, but it actually worked out extremely well. So my own personal experience was that uh, I took over the Ukraine country program. And so I went into Ukraine for a period of two years. Ukraine was very famous during its Soviet era uh, for being a weapons production country, uh, especially in a few of the institutes in especially Lviv and Odessa. So uh, Department of Defense money went in. We convinced those scientists to uh, convert those laboratories to true public health facilities, to decommission a lot of the more dangerous work that they were doing with animals that we consider in modern day not safe. And uh, not safe just for them, but you know they can also spread it with outside the laboratory. But we also wanted to minimize that weapon and the weaponization capability anymore. Um, and to say that we minimized weaponization capability is not really true, but what we did was gave them a whole different set of tool sets and a whole different set of motivations to work on different things. And largely that has worked, other than maybe some uh, poor infrastructure choices that we made it a few, yes. few times Agreed. along the way. <laughs> Agree with that. <laughs> and that, uh, you know, a lot of that has to do with US contracting system. When you ask the contractor, what does this person need? They're gonna tell you it needs 10 times bigger than what you actually need because that's what the contractor is there for. So. Um, I'd like to open it up to the audience um, with questions. Andrew? Uh, the most revered uh, cleric in Iraq among the Shia, which is mm -hmm. like 55% of the population, yeah. was the Ayatollah Sistani, yeah. who issued a fatwa during the, after, after the war was over that no one of the Shia could work for DOD or the U.S. military, but they work, could work for USAID. Yeah. And he had it read at each mosque because his perception was, not inaccurately, that it's a little difficult to mix the two things. Absolutely. That argue should be mixed. And the perception in much of the developing world is, is the same yeah. as the Ayatollah Sistani. We did a branding campaign for the USAID logo and we tested it. And some people in Congress said, why don't you use the American flag instead of mm -hmm. the USAID logo? So we tested that. Yeah. And it was very interesting. A across the world, people said the American flag means the military. And yeah. we do not want the military associated with mm -hmm. our development program in our country. We then tested the aid logo, and they said, we know the aid logo. We know all they do is this stuff, uh, are the stuff yeah. that we want. And so there was a very big disparity. We hired a private company to do the the polling for us. And I didn't want to tell Congress that there was this disparity because people think, you know, people are hostile to the United States. Yeah. They're hostile because they see DOD, and I'm a former military officer, I'm yeah. not hostile to DOD at all. Yeah. But there is this dis difference in perception. Is that not a problem? Uh, it is a problem, but I think it's our lack of branding, as I was talking about earlier. Uh, in Jerry's class earlier today, I was just bringing up another example. There was another hemorrhagic fever very similar to Ebola that was a massive problem for Argentina. Argentine hemorrhagic fever, Hunin is the name locally. Um, it is the closest cousin to Lassa fever, the one I mentioned up there, and it affects mainly the same population, poor farmers. Uh, at the time, it was considered a major security threat to the United States military, so USAMRID developed a very successful vaccine for Hunin. And, uh, it's very, it, hardly anyone ever knows this story, but uh, mm -hmm. it was a case where it was seen that this is not just a military priority, these people actually need this vaccine. So all patents and facilities and production was given to Argentina and transferred to Argentina and it's been there for the last 25 years and they've had almost zero cases of Hunin since that time. Yellow fever vaccine, military invention. Mm -hmm. Most vaccines tend to come from military you laboratory. Know, oh, I know, I'm just <laughs> explaining to the broader audience right. that <laughs> most of those vaccines and I'm not gonna say all of them because that's not true, but many of them, especially the ones that are happening in these areas, it's considered a threat to the soldier first, but the way that both Dr. Parker and myself have used that system and integrated in that system is, yes, it's made for the warfighter, 
but we see the broad application to public health, and um, I've spent my career selling that. And mm -hmm. so, thus far, I've never had a problem. Uh, I am always pretty open about wearing my DOD hat. Um, again, we were talking earlier, there are protocols established, so, you know, if there's an epidemic and I happen to be the first person there and in charge, if CDC shows up, it's automatically understood I stand down. I'm then in a support role because that's CDC's mission. So. And Andrew, maybe another good example that is really goes under the radar screen that it's a, a DOD capabilities are, we have um, Oconus Laboratories. Yeah, and so absolutely. we have um, not many, uh, six. but we have six, yeah. six uh, Army and Navy laboratories in um, important parts of the world. And they actually have developed very good relationships with their, not only the host country they're in, but with the whole region. And they um, have such good relationships that they are actually very well uh, regarded, very well respected, and, and they actually are a source of funding in some of the countries mm -hmm. to help establish um, um, surveillance capa capabilities and depi capabilities. And, and so this is one of those, again, one of those hidden, you know, national assets that um, we don't take um, care, uh, we need to take better care of these national assets and, and the people yeah. that deploy and work in these laboratories because uh, yeah. they're really critical. And even what Jerry mentioned there, the vast majority of those employees in those laboratories are local nationals. Mm -hmm. We're there to train them, we're there to help them. So there will be U.S. officers and other mm -hmm. personnel coming through, but the vast majority are locals. Um, and the best example I can give of this, it's going through hard times right now, but look at Cairo. We have had a U.S. Navy laboratory in Cairo for 60 years. It yes. is considered a hallmark of their public health system. Yes. Everyone knows this laboratory. Uh, and if you're trained in that laboratory, you can get a very good job anywhere in Egypt or outside of Egypt. So, mm -hmm. yeah, those are all DOD inputs. And again, we just don't advertise them that much. And I think it's largely due to the fear that it might be construed as, oh, you're there doing, conducting surveillance. That's why I was even hesitant to mention intelligence because that's usually the first question I get is, are you a, CI officer here to see our situation, et cetera. So we try not to draw those parallels too many times. Of course, they're all working together uh, for information. But um, yeah, if you're upfront about it in the first hand and just what we're there for. And then I find, uh, I always tell people, I, I bring up my southerness in this, uh, give me a chance to screw up before you really get angry with me. <laughs> and if I screw up, I'll, I'll take it. But like, uh, until then, at least give me the benefit of the doubt. Mm -hmm. I see, I see some students in the audience. Um, any questions from any of the students? Hi, so Jared Rome, I'm a <clears throat> junior poli sci major here. I was, uh, the, the idea sounds, it sounds amazing. But I was wondering, uh, talking about DOD resources, with the U.S. at Mercy and Comfort and the Maritime yes. Prepositioning Force, is that not a capability that could perhaps be better utilized rather than coming off with something entirely new? Indeed, they probably could, but um, we are dealing with such a specific circumstance with infectious disease. Those are triage and trauma hospitals. They're not really infectious disease or isolation wards. I mean, theoretically, we could retrofit them to do that, but uh, I, I wouldn't see that happening with those, those assets just because they are so heavily used for standard uh, use right now. I, I learned a little bit about those ships actually during Hurricane Katrina and I, yeah. actually there's a lot of ports they can't get into. Yeah. And so that, that's, we maybe yeah. argue against, yeah. against not. Yeah, not, they're, they're tanker ships yeah. as opposed to, you know, more of a sizable one or less sizable one, right? I, I have a question maybe I'm gonna put my hat on as a student that maybe um, some are um, maybe hesitant to, to talk about. And so, um, Dr. Fair, what kind of maybe motivated you um, to maybe go down this career path and where there's some, where there's some pivotal pe people uh, that, um, that uh, kind of helped you um, go down this Absolutely. line and that might be helpful to our emerging scholars here that uh, might want to get in the fight? I'm laughing a little bit because Jerry was one of those very first people that got <laughs> me into this. but. Um, <laughs> Uh, Jerry was uh, deputy commander at USAMRIT at the time, uh, which had just became famous from the movie Outbreak. I knew it before the movie Outbreak, which is <laughs> probably the most inaccurate film ever. Uh, it was. <laughs> but uh, if you want to watch a really accurate film, it's Contagion, but it's just not as exciting as Outbreak, right? Like, it's, uh, it's, it's the day-to-day -day of what we do. Um, 
but I actually uh, remember writing a letter. That was back when we were still writing letters to Dave Franz yeah. and uh, the commander at the time, and I uh, remember him very surprisingly responding to me as a freshman in college and asking me to come up and spend the summer. And uh, I spent the summer around the office with, uh, with Jerry and Dave. Uh, I went through, after that, I was actually uh, a Jesuit seminarian at the time, going through Jesuit seminary. Um, so what motivated me to do this? Uh, anybody familiar with the Jesuits? We are the, mm -hmm. the militants of the Catholic Church, uh, but they are, uh, the, really the foundation of the Jesuits is to, to give up service and particularly to do that in low, low resource and terrible environments um, and uh, to try to alleviate some of the, uh, the effects of poverty and disease and so forth. So I would say that was a major motivation for me. Uh, I obviously didn't uh, take the vows or go into the cloth, but uh, I had learned French very well uh, uh, in college and uh, I met a primatologist just as I was leaving that had worked at Pasteur Institute and I became a liaison for Pasteur Institute and the U.S. government for around five years. And that was before I had any graduate degree, so this was really when I was a technician kind of at the lowest level. Um, and I really struggled with that. Do I want to take a break between college and grad school or do I want to just go on and become that ultimate grad student? I can't tell you how much it helped me. <laughs> After five years in the field, I knew exactly what I wanted to do. I knew exactly where my passions were. When I went into graduate school, um, I wasn't the oldest in the class. I was like maybe the second oldest, but um, I finished first. And it was because I knew what I wanted to do. Uh, and I had spent all those years training on the laboratory techniques, which if you're going in blind, you're going to spend half your time just kind of trying to learn those techniques and how they work and so forth. Uh, and then after, uh, during graduate school, I actually was appointed as a DOD fellow in a new program, mm -hmm. which any of you that are looking to go into graduate school, this has actually become quite a large program now. It started out with nine people. I was one of the first nine. And that's called the SMART program. Um, and it's always funny to call myself a SMART fellow, but um, <laughs> stands for Science, Mathematics, and Research for Transformation in the Defense Department. And so this was a new DOD initiative to recruit scientists while they're young in their age and that they would uh, be promoted very quickly through the defense system. So I did that program. I was sponsored by DARPA and ended up at USAMRIT again. And uh, it allowed me to bypass my postdoctoral phase and go in di directly to a senior staff scientist position. So um, research those types of programs because DOD is not the only one with programs like that. But I highly recommend that one if, if it is one that you would uh, be interested in. CDC, others have programs where you can get involved at an early age. And the earlier that you can do this, the better. Uh, I also highly recommend volunteering overseas in some form or capacity. It doesn't have to be on an outbreak. The reason I say that is um, I think so many of us have romantic ideals about what it's going to be like overseas, you know, wherever you are, Africa, Asia, et cetera. The reality is when you get in these situations, you're in the worst of the worst. It's mud, uh, you're in the mud. You're in the mud, blood, sweat, tears, it's nasty, there's a lot of death, there's conflict, there's conflict around you, and I'm not talking about the outbreak, I'm talking about civil conflicts with people with guns, and so you're worrying about bullets and riots and everything else as well. So um, make sure you're committed, and uh, an easy way to do that is go do an international volunteer experience. It might not be for you, but Maybe you're like me and uh, it gets under your skin and that's going to be the rest of your life, so who knows. No, thank you. Any, yes, Peter. <coughs> yes. Oh. Well, go ahead in the back, yes. What is the, uh, you're talking about an actually occurring pandemic. Yes. What, uh, I worry about what they're facing maybe from coming out of Russia, from their different experiments yeah. they've had going on for a long period of time, or North Korea, if they yeah. 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 The preparedness is essentially the same because what we do is we try to establish these baseline surveillance systems for these diseases that we're worried about. And it's when we see an anomaly in that system that we can say there's an epidemic there, there's something strange going on there. Um, I'd say that we're further along on the animal side on that than we are the humans. And the re simple reason for that is in most countries, animals are worth more than humans. Uh, the livestock industry is much more valuable than your human population, so people tend to pay a lot more in, uh, attention to the livestock. We're getting there with our human surveillance systems, but every year it's a fight. Every year it's a fight for your budget. Um, 
if a pandemic flu didn't happen this year, the question you get the next year is, why do you need that much money? And the year that it happens, it's going to be, <laughs> well, why weren't you watching for that? Uh, so like I said in the beginning, public health is a little bit damned if you do, damned if you don't. That being said, you know, we, we try to maintain a balance uh, and try to get ahead of the curve as much as we can. That, that topic is probably worth um, another um, seminar like, uh, <laughs> like this focused on that topic. Yeah. So thank you for the question, yeah. Peter. Yes, um, I come out of the world of academic tourism. Yes. And I noticed on your list that you did not list the world of tourism. Yeah. I would at least like mm -hmm. you to consider that. Mm -hmm. We move more people around the yeah. world than any place mm -hmm. else. Absolutely. We're yeah. the first, second, or third largest industry in yeah. business, as you want to count it. Yeah. And one of the problems, and, and when I listen to you, you sound just like when we speak about risk management in yeah. tourism. Yeah. When something Same. doesn't happen, why are you spending the money? Yeah. When it does happen, why did you waste the money? Yeah, so exactly. I really interact with you on that. Yeah. One of the problems that needs to be considered is that often when you do it right according to public health, you do it wrong according to parts of the tourism industry. Sure. And I'll give you one example of that is what happened with H1N1 in Cancun mm -hmm. and in Mexico, mm -hmm. where they did everything right and they almost had a government revolution because people stopped coming which caused such economic chaos yeah. that all the hotels went under the 60% uh, level they needed to survive. Mm -hmm. Or Toronto, Canada, with SARS, yeah. where if there's anything they hate, yeah. you say the World Health Organization, and they go into a complete yeah. tizzy. So one of the things I think we need to maybe work on is how do we interact those issues? Yeah. The moving of millions of people yeah. carrying diseases from one place to the other, yes. and secondly, the economics of it. So, you know, I think there's some low-hanging fruit in that, right? Um, one example is the Hajj. Every year we have the Hajj. Uh, millions and millions of people coming from every single corner of the earth. Our biggest fear during this Ebola outbreak was someone was going to go to the Hajj and release Ebola into the crowd. Let me take that back. That's probably our second biggest fear. Our biggest fear was Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, which is circulating in the Middle East right now, and our fear that that would be spread to, say, an African that came back from the Hajj, and then they spread it in an African population, which Saudi Arabia is ill-prepared, Africa is not prepared. And so you would lo be looking at a mass uh, um, casualty event there. Uh, I'll bring up an interesting point on tourism. I don't think about tourism as much uh, just because I don't ever get to go to work in any of the nice countries that always ends up being <laughs> the conflict zones and things like that. Like, uh, not too many tourists following me in there, but. Um, <laughs> But what I was thinking about that I, it was it was really a surprise for me was uh, you know this Ebola outbreak happened in West Africa. Uh, as Americans in particular, our sense of geography is very bad. But there's literally thousands of miles between West Africa and South Africa. South Africans' tourism dropped off by about seventy percent during Ebola. Mm -hmm. um, they had nothing to do with Ebola. <laughs> They had a lab sent there, but otherwise there was no Ebola in South Africa and you're thousands of miles away in a completely different system. Um, but we just associated Africa with Ebola and tourism cut off altogether, crippling the country. And that's probably a large reason why South African Airways is going bankrupt. Mm -hmm. I think we have one more time for one more. <coughs> um, following up on this, uh, the epidemics occur in increasing amounts of publicity in social media and um, basic rule is that fear tends to run faster than facts. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, how do you uh, how do you plan, <coughs> how do you adjust, how do you continue just to a world of where you can't control the message when you do send out the message it gets it gets warped and, yeah. uh, and then you have people uh, just trying to take advantage of that. Again, I'm yeah. thinking of the US reaction. Um, for the lesson I would say that I've learned over the years is the messaging comes first, absolutely first. Um, you've got to get ahead of it. Um, as scientists, as physicians, as clinicians, as laboratorians, we want to get in there. We want to get the patient. We want to get them isolated. We want to get the data. Um, but the reality is you need to get ahead of the fear first. Um, that's where we lost it with Ebola. The fear got ahead of us. Um, an example would be someone would come into a treatment center and they would be indeed positive. They would then walk out of that treatment center, uh, catch a motorcycle, drive to another city, probably in Guinea or in Liberia, 
go to another treatment center hoping for a different answer, hoping that was a false positive. Um, but what they've just done is expose the taxi driver and their families and everyone else. And so we had a lot of that. Mm. The fear yeah, got ahead of us. Yeah, even in, even in uh, Texas, during the Ebola in Texas, we had, I, would, I, I call it legitimate public fear, but it became irrational. Uh, but a lot of it because we didn't have a good message. And I, you know, I, I want to go back to your earlier question about you know worrying about the bioterrorism. I, I can tell you that myself, I am much, much less concerned about bioterrorism than I am natural pandemics and epidemics happening, um, and especially with regarding flu. Um, nature is much smarter than us, mm -hmm. and it has had a lot more time to play with the recipes. Um, <laughs> and so, you know. Back when in my HIV days, when people would ask me if HIV is a conspiracy, I was like, I'd love to meet the scientists that met it, yeah. or made it because it's truly a remarkable virus. So um, I'm not quite as worried about the bioterrorism. It's definitely an issue. Um, we were just speaking earlier about the North, North Korean defector that just came across. Um, interestingly, his blood was taken, and he is highly positive for anthrax antibodies. So what that means is, he either actually got exposed to anthrax naturally in North Korea, or their military is vaccinating them for anthrax. And if they are, why are they doing that? Mm -hmm. Well, thank, I want to first thank the audience for all the... <laughs> <laughs> you got to let me stop yeah. on that question. Oh, okay. oh you're going, you're going. Okay, go oh, ahead. no, I'm done. Yeah. <laughs> but I think we left a cliffhanger. That's always the perfect, yeah. yeah. That's a good one. To yeah. be continued. But we'll, we'll, have a, we'll have a session on that. But um, it... it the North Korea <coughs> weapons of mass destruction is a big issue, and we certainly know about the, the uh, development of the nuclear weapons and the missiles that can carry them. Um, I think there are other, other threats that we need mm. to be concerned about as, as well. Um, the problem is it's so hard to get information. It's so hard to, to know. Yeah. Um, but um, with this recent information that Dr. Fair just mentioned, I know I've had conversations with people in the South Korean government uh, and, and military. Um, I, I think we have to assume and, and, that, and, and South Korea needs to take all necessary action to be better prepared for any Absolutely. biological threat, whether it's intentional, uh, natural, or accidental. And we need to do the same here in the United States and help, help, um, help in the global community where uh, the capacities are needed so we can prevent an outbreak anywhere from becoming an epidemic or pandemic. And that's really what you know, yeah. our goal is. I just want to close on one last point. And you, know, you just said three things. You said uh, naturally occurring, bioterror, mm -hmm. or accidental, mm -hmm. that third one. That's what we call bio error. Mm -hmm. That's someone that didn't mean to do anything wrong. They were a lab tech. They didn't know that tube was the wrong tube, et cetera. Uh, we had a, a situation in Kinshasa about a year ago where we had a break-in, uh, local break-in. Now, these people weren't breaking in to steal Ebola virus, they were breaking in to steal the computers and phones and everything else, but they broke into the room where we store all of the Ebola virus. So that would have been a bio-error catastrophe. Um, so that's our third mm -hmm. concern, I would say. Uh, maybe even a little bit higher than bioterror in some ways. Might be, <laughs> yeah. with doing this research and concern. Yeah. So with that, we probably should conclude this session. First, I want to thank the audience for all the great questions and the dialogue. That's really, um, that's fantastic that we can really have a conversation. And then I really want to thank um, Dr. Joseph Fair for, actually first for his, his career, his work that he's doing and, um, and being a d disease fighter where it ma matters the most and, and for a wonderful talk tonight. So Joseph, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.